um, to this session. Um, we're going to be hearing a talk from Nicholas, um, who's going to be talking about taking control of your code base, which, if anyone is like me, is a really pertinent talk. So thank you very much, um, Nicholas. OK. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about tracking back control of your code base, specifically working at Fersham, which is sort of a startup. It's even that's unclear. Like the requirement for what the project is that we should be building is unclear, and therefore you have no real target of where to go. So your program gets refactored about every other week in large ways, which means that it just gets hairy. So this is what the talk is about. Um, and as I said, uh, the requirements couldn't actually be set in stone of what it is that we were building. So we're building a, a, a workflow system to manage uh, a chatbot flow and attach it to natural language and, and these things. But it's mostly regarding the workflow that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so yeah, it, it did get quite horrible. I mean, it was just one of those that place um, set up code where you have to deliver something in two weeks and you rush, you get it done, it's out in two weeks and you look at it and you're like, I want to cry now, this is horrible, why, why am I doing that? You know, um, and I'm sure we've all been there. So it's pretty much just of me sharing some of the strategies that I applied. Um, they're not unique, or most of them are copied from other people's good strategies, um, but hopefully it'll be useful to you. And obviously there's the big important thing of like, you need to measure what it is you're doing, else you don't know what your progress is. So one of your goals is to actually find metrics as to how well am I m being able to control my code base. All right, so here's a, an agenda. I have a bit of a preamble, and then I'll discuss simplicity, uh, risk, uh, static analysis, which is testing, and you know having an internal data format, formalizing it, which is something which very few people do, but it really helped a lot. And a profiling, will, I'll do a little, it's a use case of actually using some of these strategies and getting a better performance in the product, which we all like. Um, so very common things that happens with uh, when you say, I want to control my code base. You have, you have a, you use a static analyzer, you set up logging, reporting, you use something like Sentry, if something goes wrong so that you know it went wrong. You use, I have a test suit, you set it up so it works, you, you know, autopilot deployment, uh, a lot of these things. Um, but some strategies which I found is often underutilized is people don't consider like complexity in the right way. Um, so Heineck yesterday mentioned a talk which I'm referring to here by, I forgot the guy who did a closure and it was regarding what is simple and what is easy and what the difference between those are. And it's actually quite important. Um, really? <laughs> Go away. Can we just turn the Wi-Fi off? Oh, I can just do a switch. Done, OK. All right. Um, so another thing is loose coupling, uh, which was mentioned in the previous talk. We It's really important to find a way of of disconnecting the components so that they do fewer things at a time and there's less interference and less complexity. And obviously, it's important that your system scales because it's a running several customers, in our case, on one system. So, f you know, for cost reasons, you need to get it down. Um, you need to get performance good. So that's the uh, related thing. So another important thing is obviously, this is standard to have a QA system that monitors your production system. Uh, have a, a separate test or playground system where you can break things all the time, but doesn't have to mirror exactly, but be pretty close to your QA system. Uh, I did kind of mention it's prepare environment to record unexpected failures, use Sentry or equivalent to what Sentry is awesome. Um, you know, the basic common things that you actually want to have done on your system. Just do your basic homework first. Uh, and that is something that we actually didn't do at first, and it did come back to hurt us a lot. So please you do it. Um, another thing is decided, you know what, Python 2 is getting old. Let's just stick to Python 3. And I said minimum version, Python 3.5. I'm not even looking at older versions of Python code. And you get some fantastic features, like type annotations, 
it really helps. I mean, especially if you're using a, a text editor like PyCharm, it understands these and you get significantly better code completion and it will automatically highlight things while you're busy working. It really does make it a, a lot easier to spot, spot uh, common mistakes. Um, first class tick merge operations, uh, that's pretty awesome. So I'm not quite sure if you rel if you know what I'm talking about. So normally with the dictionary, you've got, you've got key A, you've got key B, but now C and D both are dictionaries and I'm just inserting this dictionary. I'm not changing C or D, I'm just making a copy of the content into the new dictionary. So you can actually do uh, functional style uh, dictional merging without having to do, you know, E equals has A and B and then E to update C and then E to update D. Y you know, it's, it's a lot cleaner to write codes like that. Super works. That's great. Python 2 super is pretty horrible. Um, we have to specify your own class. So that's not cool. Use super just works as you expect in Python 3, which is great. Um, yeah, separation between text and binary, that's a big deal for a lot of people. Um, the reason why I think it's a pro is because when you're dealing with humans, you're dealing with text. When you're dealing with computers, you're dealing with binary. And having a clear separation between these two has actually saved, especially when we're dealing with Unicode and those kind of things. Um, by since migrating the code base over to Python 3 only and having to deal with text and binary as a separate thing, I've not had a single Unicode bug, which is, I'm sure, it, it hurts. Um, and uh, obviously, you get the old, the, some of the new functionality for async programming, which is awesome. We all, all we all like that. Um, so, important thing, when you're working with code, it ends up getting very complicated. A common path strategy, and a, a, a mistake we made, was we had too much, too much uh, logic into the models, you know, as part of Django. So you've got using the persistence model in Django, and then you added some logic on the model files, and after a while you end up with a two and a half thousand line models file and you have no idea what's going on anymore. Um, it's untestable, it's just a mess. It's, it really, and it was easy to do that because it was the obvious thing to do, but it's not simple. You are hurting yourself by doing, by simpler, to getting uh, these things wrong. So the example from the other talk uh, by, by the creator of Clojure, he was comparing SOAP and JSON REST. And it pretty much comes down to in sum, assuming that these implementations are perfect and there is no bugs in the spec or anything like that, which there is because of complexity, um, SOAP is easy to use. You just point the service to SOAP, you get a discovery, you see exactly what's going on there, documentation, it just pops up in your editor, you can use it. No problem. It's great. Um, and JSON is difficult because now you have to go find the documentation, read it, implement all the things yourself. You know, so it's a lot more it's not so easy to just get started. Uh, but on the counterpoint, SOAP fails all the time because uh, the specification is not clear. Uh, using an XML document, which a document is data and formatting information. So it's not just data. So now you're complicating your data by wrapping with format information, which may not be useful. And then you're using this to wrap as a descriptor, to wrap your message, to wrap your function call. To it's complicated. and it ends up being, what happened is, they, they end up failing. I'm sure everybody's done lots of integration with um, SOAP-based systems. They're always a pain. I have yet to come across one that actually followed the spec. Yeah, it, it doesn't happen. Whereas JSON REST, because of its simplicity, tends to be a lot easier to, w to get going. Because once you get started, it works. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Life goes on. I'm I'm happy with that, you know. So that is where the the mere com complexity of trying to make something easy actually makes things incredibly difficult, and it's something you do need to keep in mind. Um, okay, I did kind of mention that there. So luckily, there's all these progress going on where we're trying to do make JSON a bit more discoverable, <laughs> give it more functionality. And I think so far it's only Open API or Swagger, whichever word you want to use, that seems to be have been taken off well. Um, and what they did there is they don't even care about touching the interface. It's a separate document describing what your API should look like. 
So they still kept your implementation and the description of your implementation separate. They just made it machine readable. And that is another a simple way of doing it. Instead of uh, the hyperlinks that people wanted to put inside JSON REST, I don't have a sample, I should have done it, where you follow links to get to the next thing. And it, it never quite worked well because it was adding complexity. Um, so that's that. So now, risk. <laughs> risk is a thing that uh, I had a had quite a few disputes with people regarding managing code like this, but especially because I don't have enough time to get everything done I need to do. I need to get something out. It's how do I make my life better? And this is what the question is here. So it's pretty much you're splitting your code up into some things are high risk. I mean, it's dealing with lives, money. Uh, it's the core part of your product. You know, so you say this section of the code is high risk and your market is make it clear that everything here you need to be very careful about. Um, some things are low risk, it's the once off deployment script or a migration thing, or well those aren't actually the low risk, sorry. But anything where you run it very rarely or the only way you can run it is by use is by doing it interactively. Um, you're actually testing that as your test suit. Um, it's much more difficult to write test cases for it, it's not really worthwhile. To, to do that. So this is pretty much how I ended up cutting up the code base up. These things, I actually don't care if things break there because it's used once or twice ever and it probably won't be used again. So I might as well delete it. And these things are core. They need to be important. I really always need to get them. And everything else you leave as the medium risk level. Um, so the reason I it is, it allows me to just focus a bit more on what's important. So as I said, with low risk stuff, w with everything, obviously, use linters, type checkers. Um, low risk stuff often will be running with a high skilled person to supervise if it's a set up a project script or something like that. Um, medium is where the majority of your code is going to be. And what you end up doing there is you don't try to go for 100% test coverage with like, unit tests. You just say, all right, here is my specification. It should do this. If I do this, then this must happen. And you end up writing your tests more uh, along behavioral levels or integration tests. And what's kind of nice with that is doing more high-level tests actually finds breakages quite well. And um, as long as you handle general purpose uh, success cases, fail cases, and you don't worry about getting it all exactly right. It actually gives you pretty good coverage as it's going on. And a fantastic tool, Hypothesis. So um, I can get to, I'll get to that a bit later, but it was a, it's, a, it's a tool that essentially you give it a schema and a strategy and it will generate data and you send this into some of your code and it will, it will break things because you never expected a negative infinite in your program because, you know, why not? And you never expected a, a unicate s a, a string that's actually encoded with UTF-8 and Latin 1 halfway changing, because, you know, this happens. If anybody uses Windows, you're likely to get text like that. People suddenly start typing, you know, uni like uh, characters that wasn't supported in the original, because you'll get something that starts with Latin 1, and then it <laughs> continues with UTF-8. And you're like, I don't know why it does that, but it, it happens in real life, and this thing will break your system if your system will not fail with these or handle these kind of things. And obviously for high level testing, it's critical, you know, make sure you do it right. Um, all right, static analysis is a useful thing. It's not fabulous, um, but really it does help, especially if you have a horrible set of code or your code base is regressed in such a horrible state where you, you, you feel icky touching it. So it was one of the first steps you do. And um, style is important. It makes it more readable. So definitely use that. And often people <coughs> use tool like Flag 8 to have a check for PIP 8 compatibility. Um, you can at least disable some things if you disagree with how it works. If you want to line up your equals, you can tell it, st stop worrying about that. Then you'll, you can do it. Um, so definitely use a static analyzer. And here is... I'm focusing on Pylons here. Pylons are a really powerful static ana analyzer. Problem is, it's way too noisy. If you have a project <laughs> that's a bit of a mess, you run it, you get 2,000 warnings or errors, and you're like, I I'm never going to go through those. Like, never. So, step one, 
disable the very noisy things, which usually is convention. It's where it says you don't have your document, you don't have a doc string set up, or this white space around operators. You know, these things are important to get to, but you shouldn't focus them straight away. But uh, I would recommend, at, me at least with your product, to run pylon-e, which is check for errors only, and it finds a lot of errors. It even infers types, if it can, and say, A, this thing expected, uh, you know, an iterable, but you're passing an, an, a number. A number is not iterable. Like, this will never work. Um, so it, it's really useful. Please use a tool like that. Another really nice tool is MyPy, which is uh, specifically for type checking. And <coughs> you, they sort of made it work with Python 2.7 code bases by using comments, strings. But it's, you can have it as a native part of Python 3.5. You can go and read on the typing module. Um, it's great. And this especially has been incredibly useful for when I'm doing a refactor. Especially if you have to refactor something that was, that has a set of required function parameters or you change the order by accident of these parameters, then this thing will pick up. Like you're sending in things that will not work. So before you even get to testing, it comes up with things. Um, it isn't the fastest, but I've, I found it worthwhile and I'll just keep on using it. So obviously testing is very important. We all love to write tests, don't we? Not really. Okay. <laughs> you, get the, you get the week where you just want to write the test, but it doesn't always happen. So an important thing is, please, if you can get hold of a, a real manual tester that are invaluable, because they think in a totally different way, they'll... Their mindset is not about building something, it's about how do I break it? Um, you know, the best testers are those that, you know, would say like, oh, I was going onto the internet banking and I, I, I wanted to see if I, what happens if I enter a Unicode pass password, would it fail? But I decided, you know, I'd probably get into trouble if I do that. So they have to have that kind of a mentality of trying to break everything. There's a similar mentality to uh, security researchers where they, their job is to tinker and make things break. And um, so we don't think that way. It's really useful. Please, if you can, get someone like that. But of course, automated testing, important. The previous talk was all about it. Um, he covered pretty much everything, but I'll repeat some of the things here. Um, so one of the things I'm saying is the real reason I believe you should try tests is for control. It's not about making sure a program works or program fails properly. It's so that you can harass control. If you have a good enough test suit, um, you can refactor, you can add a certain functionality, and you can be relatively confident that you didn't make everybody else's life worse, which is actually quite important when there's more than one of you and or if you have customers using your system. Um, Another thing it definitely does is it makes you feel more confident about your code. So you actually start hating it less because, you know, <laughs> yeah, we all went there, I'm sure. Um, so that's a, that's a big thing. Like it, it really, it, it, if it, it motivates you to keep on working on this project because it's not so bad anymore. Um, all right. Another thing I really have to introduce you guys, which often gets overlooked in testing talks is using a behavior driven test test tool. So I'm a fan of behave and behave is a, is a sort of a test runner. It uses the given when then statements um, and it assumes nothing. So it doesn't assume environment. It doesn't assume that it's running through Selenium or any of those kind of things. It is basically a parser for this and it does things. And I'm in this one project, I'm actually using it for two separate things. One case, I'm testing that the Roughly that the web interface works adequately, um, the editor and all these kind of functionality works. And the other one, I'm, I'm actually using it to t as a state machine to test the state machine, because unfortunately state machines depend on so much setup that writing these tests as manual unit tests is, is actually not very feasible. It, it's an incredible amount of work. So in this case, I say it's more a case of given I do this and then I get that, I expect this. And it's it's just a it's a clear way of writing tests and I would recommend you try to use some tool like Behave on all your on all your whole code base as if you can. 
Um, it isn't good for testing specific edge cases, but it's pretty good for testing, you know, common things people do. And this is often the more important thing to make sure it actually works fine. So you have to make sure that what they call the golden path works. You have to make sure some of the variations of it works, but it doesn't really test for the critical edge case of what happens if you have a timeout at this point, you know, and now does you really try cause a, a cascade of issues. It, it can't test these things and it's not designed for that. But um, great tool, I would recommend you guys look at it. It's everybody I showed it to actually liked it. So let's leave it at that. Another tool you guys should really look at is Hypothesis. And Hypothesis is uh, it's essentially a fuzzer. You give it a, uh, they call it a strategy, but it's essentially a schema. And you say, generate data like this, send it to my system. Uh, it'll generate, say, 200 sets of this data for your test run. And um, it really breaks your code. Um, there's a, y yes, um, it, w it was frustrating. At one point, I set this up on, I'll talk about, mm, I have to go quicker. Uh, about the uh, data interchange format that I did, and for the persistence layer, and it it was a week a week of me fixing bugs um, that actually were these almost Heisenbergs that appeared and didn't appear. And you know, it really finds it, it helps you a lot in, in things. Um, obviously, use coverage and you really try it on your high on the test or the code that you marked as high risk functionality is high risk. You know. You can go for hundred percent coverage there, but it's not really worth it for anywhere for everywhere else. That's been my experience um, because we don't have enough time. And if I could do everything perfectly, well, I don't know. The job wouldn't be so exciting. So let's leave it at that. And the other thing that I found that worked very well is as part of isolating your functions, you def you formally design an integer format. So for the case of defining how our workflows configured, I did a JSON schema um, as an integer format because I want to be able to persist it as a JSON or export. And, you and I got a lot of bunch of free functionality by doing that, so that great. And other places ended up using Azure and tried to use it more or less logicless. So have something coming to Azure go out so that you have a, a clear handover between your different applications. And it's actually, uh, it makes it significantly easier to refactor um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, sorry. I'm going to speed up. It is, it does make refactoring easier because it puts a clear separation between things and, um, you know, uh, errors will end up happening more or less on the boundaries and not anywhere. And uh, here's a sort of a quick little diagram of very roughly, I have my workflow editor up there, I had the models, which is persistence and the workflow and was all sort of working and the workflow editor did direct Django model access and uh, it was a disaster because it would break all the bloody time for no reason just because somebody somewhere did something different and you break something somewhere else. It was not cool. So put in a uh, functionality, there we had my JSON schema in between and then I had m some special model serialization <laughs> methods that will serialize and deserialize and the errors only ever happened there and instantly in the span of about a week, the program was significantly more robust. And um, the editor stopped editing out for bizarre reasons that you couldn't ever trace. So it really, it is worthwhile just breaking it out. But then, obviously, I couldn't stop there. I had to break out this, what's the workflow doing inside the persistence model? So I broke it out, so the workflow runs separately, which now turns out that it only reads the, the, the workflow configuration read only. Fantastic um, opportunity for cacheable, and I got a, ni you know, a nice performance boost. So that's all great. Obviously, one of the other reasons you want to do it is for yourself, so that you can say, hey, I got the program to run 10 times faster. You know, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? So enter VMProf. Uh, we've probably heard a talk before here. It is a really nice Python profiler. It, it tracks more or less everything. I really uh, recommend just play with it and you will immediately spot something pointless. And this, what I'm going to do is a real world sample of what happened in this project when I decided to make it run faster. Because the first thing I did is I created a baseline benchmark and said, okay, how many operations a second or transaction 
uh, interactions a second am I doing? And it uh, was a, a, pi a partly AT. And you're like, no, what? No, that's not good enough. It's not going to scale well. It needs to be better. And I said, you know, 400, I think, is a target I'm going to go for. Let's see what that happens. So I then found out there was some Django caching optimization. I just disabled it to see what was going on. And lo and behold, it ran faster. Ha. So, you know, don't follow other people's recommendations blindly. Measure it. Um, then I spent about, in this case, was about a week trying to go over all the little details to tune and fix things. And it went a little bit faster. Like it's not instead of 108, 138 requests a second or interactions a second. And you're like, yeah, it's really not working. Then I tried VMProf. And straight away, I saw that my JSON schema validator took about, you know, a significant, about two thirds of the processing time. Replace that with another one called Fast JSON Schema, and performance nearly doubled straight away. I was like, okay, well, that was easy. Um, oh, date parse takes forever to parse the dates because, but I said, but we actually did specify the dates should be the ISO 608 format, the ISO format. So I changed it to the ISO 601 module and got a nice, you know, speed up there, but a whole millisecond. It is what it took to parse a date with date parse. It was literature's like why? You know? Um found out that every time when I do a log a log something through the Django RM, it creates a big object, which it then just cards immediately. So I said, you know what, in this one case I'll just do SQL directly. I got a bit of a speed up, but it wasn't quite that much. And then I noticed that I was spending a significant amount of time waiting for the database. And I said, Well the session store is actually transient, it lives for minutes to an hour, it's not a, or two hours, it's not a big deal. So I said, how about I just use Redis instead? Oh, wow, look at that. I really, really beat my, my target straight off. And after this, there was nothing much obvious left, so I just thought I'd leave it, I beat my target. Um, unfortunately, a manual tester got a hold of it and said, you broke stuff. So it's slower again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, you know, how it happens. But the whole pro profiling with VMProf uh, took less than two days, and it was a day where I was a client and all these things. It is like if you need to get performance over system, or even just for your own sanity, try VMProf, see what's going on. But you do need to have a baseline benchmark that actually is repeatable. Um, so, as I said, the last two changes really could only happen because I separated the schema out. So, there was a clear separation between who owns the data and what it's going on. So it was one place where I could change something and it happened relatively easily. So uh, if it was still a complete merged thing, oh my battery is about low. Sorry, it's a six year old notebook. Batteries don't last so well. Apologies. Mm. Happy. Okay. All right. Um, it would have been taking, would have been ridic ridiculously long to actually do this without all that. Am I in the right place? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I am. So the second diagram, or the third diagram I showed, where I actually then removed the workflow out, uh, which is a much later exercise. It happened months later, because that's when I had time. Um, because of the read-only interface and being a lot clearer as to when you transfer things in and out. I literally have a uh, extern package that has the things that talk to Redis and Django, and that's it. And uh, it, it pretty much doubled this specific metric, um, sitting at 1,280. It's largely possible due to, once again, separation of concerns that allows you to not only make your program easier to test, but also allow it to actually optimize it so it runs a lot better. Um, now I'm spending a dashboard a disproportionate amount of my time logging. So at some point I could change that into a message bus system where I just fire and forget the logs and something else handles all the logs and so I can get more performance. But you know, it's fine, it's good enough. And here is a diagram of the version engine workflow and on the different versions we were running and, and roughly where the performance metrics are. Um, so you can see the top, the red line is what I've, is the case study I was talking about, which is just accepting the message in for an existing user. So we don't have to create a new session. We're just working with it. Same for, 
you know, creating session is a bit slower. Um, in a case where there was no channel, the big jump was because I actually found out I was dosing myself. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, profile is really helpful for these things. It's awesome. And um, the thing that always confused me was that when the workflow was running, starting off a workflow was significantly faster than resuming a workflow, which didn't make sense because you had to do less work. Um, but after the clear separations, it was the right file around. So I guess I was doing something stupid. Actually, another thing I was pointing out, the section of the diagram uh, where I had the workflow and the persistence in one blob when I was doing this initial VM prof profiling, I looked at that, I had no idea what was going on. It was impossible for me to figure out what was actually slow um, because according to that, everything was slow and there was no clear separation between A or B. It was this big mess. So it is worthwhile, as even if you want to, especially if you want to get performance out. And as it is, I'm a lot happier about the code base. Um, it's a lot easier to show it to new people and they can actually start working on it a lot quicker and it performs 10 times faster, more or less across the board about. So that's about it. So I've got some email address, um, working on Fairstrom and Breakout. This the oh, of course, we are hiring, I have to say that. Yes, all right, uh, questions? Thank you very much. Um, questions, anyone? Uh, so you've mentioned MyPy. I've just started using it myself, and yes, it's very good. It finds a lot of bugs you don't find elsewhere, but it also, uh, do you find it also gives a lot of false positives? Uh, yeah, so um, you can at least configure it to be less severe at first, and I have cranked up the difficulty as it's going on, because if your program is not it typed comprehensively, it, it does return a lot of false positives. Um, and the more comprehensively the, the project gets typed, the less false positives you do you end up getting. Um, but it is a bit of a pain with my part to tell it to, no, stop worrying about this. One of the things I could never get it to stop complaining about was if I have a test where I'm trying to import the JSON library and because the project also has to run on PyPy, uJSON, I don't want there. So I'll try and import uJSON. If this fails, import error, then I just import JSON and then go on. That specific block, I could not figure out how to get MyPy to stop complaining about. So I just disabled that, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, so in my world, uh, I have a problem with logging, and that problem is developers like to log everything, and I mean everything. So 200 meg log files are the norm, and that's for like an hour's worth of work. Yeah. Uh, trying to find the problem in that is, is actually very difficult. So do you have any strategies for actually reducing the size of your log files and putting the stuff that's really important in there? Um, I mean, I just did the standard best practice, which is there, is that you record a level of logging and unless you set it to debug, you know, preferably drop it to a slightly lower level. So in production, you don't end up with these unbelievably large things. But trawling through the logs, no. Um, uh, one of the things that works is throwing it to a database, a nice data cube, and trying to figure out what's going on there. But it is a lot of work. Logging is, unfortunately. So you prefer to log lots of stuff than reduce the amount you're logging? I would allow the code to log a lot of things, but that have a setting to reduce the log level. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. A pleasure. <laughs> uh, thank you.